Man, it is so, so good to be with you guys this morning. Thank you guys for having us, even though you didn't know I was going to be here. And so uh, thank you <laughs> anyways. Um, this season of our life has been a little bit different. Uh, I've been in, in ministry, full-time ministry for uh, a little over 20 years. In this past year, I've had the opportunity to travel and to meet a bunch of different people across North Carolina and Virginia and had opportunities to talk about what we are doing and what our family uh, has ventured out on. Because uh, before we moved to Durham last July, our family had been in New Bern, like Chris said, for, for 12 years, a part of Two Rivers Church. And um, it was uh, just, just used to being in that, in that local ministry and then moving to Durham and a whole new change of life, a whole new type of, of ministry and everything that's been going on. Um, and all of our time in New Bern, in 12 years, not one single time did our family ever come down and visit Wilmington. I don't know how that happened, but we didn't. I think, I think we rationalized it in our heads because we were like, Atlantic Beach is only 45 minutes away. So we're just going to go to Atlantic Beach. But now that we live in Durham, believe it or not, Wilmington and, and the beaches here are closer for us. So now Wilmington is our beach town. So we will come here. My wife is a beach person. That's where she finds her, her center. That's where she is able to come and relax. Like the beach is like her place. And my kids love to come to the beach. Most of them love to come to the beach. One of them, uh, Gracie, our oldest one, um, she used to love the beach. Can I tell the story, Gracie? Is that okay? Unfortunately, being a pastor's kid, what you get to be is, is stories and examples in your dad's sermon is what happens. So uh, a few years ago when she was younger, we were at the beach, um, and she, poor thing, got stung by a stingray. I mean, it's like, and how traumatic is that? Like, you're in the beach, you're in the ocean, you get stung, and the last thing that you ever want to do is go to the beach and get in the ocean anymore. I don't, look, I love going to the beach, I don't get in the ocean. I don't get in the ocean because sharks. That's all. I know it's irrational, I get it. Like, very few people ever get attacked, but like, they're there, and they're a lot bigger than me, and they belong there, and they know how to function in the water, and I don't. So, I stay out of the beach. So um, we will be back here more and more often. If you see us at the beach, come hang out with us. But um, like Chris said, we moved to Durham to plant a new church that's launching uh, officially September 10th, but this fall, and it's called Renew Christian Church. And already we have a great group of people who are excited about what's going to happen in Durham and excited about Renew Church. We are continuing to meet people in Durham and to be able to share the love of Jesus with them. Durham is the fifth fastest growing city in, in North Carolina, by the way. Um, over 300,000 people live in Durham, and half of that will claim that they follow Jesus. And fewer and fewer people have been going to churches, and I think that there is this resurgence. I think people are looking for community. People are looking for Jesus, just as they are here in Wilmington. But we have a great opportunity to launch this church and to meet people and to share the love of Jesus. And we'll, we can talk a little bit more about that this, uh, uh, later this morning. But we are continuing this morning in the series of Salt and Light. And Jesus is teaching uh, of uh, his teaching while he is on this mountain, as he's teaching his disciples, a, a crowd of people have gathered around to hear what he's saying. And this morning, we're going to talk about how we speak to one another. And we're going to talk about how um, our words and what we say, we need to follow through with those things. And it all comes back to how we should treat people. And what we say and what we do speaks to our character and who we are. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. If you have your Bible, your app, or whatever, if you want to read along with me real quick, I'm going to read through this, and then we're going to jump in, and we're going to tear this down and apply it to our lives here. Verse 33, again, you have heard it said, um, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is God's, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, and do not swear by your head, for you cannot make 
even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, as we dive into your word today, as we dive into this teaching today, Lord, open up our hearts to hear your word. Open up our, our, our ears. Allow us to receive your word today. Apply that to our lives and to see the importance of how we should speak and treat one another. Lord, we love you. God, I thank you for Jesus and all these things we pray in his precious and holy name. Amen. So in this section, Jesus is talking about the importance of honesty and integrity and in, in all of the things that we say and do. Now, I'm sure you have heard it said, talk is cheap. Everybody, have you heard that saying before? Talk is cheap. And they say this because many times, including myself, I am just as guilty of this as anybody else, that I will say one thing and do another. Or maybe I will commit to doing that thing or saying that I will do that thing and then I never follow through with doing that thing. And many times, honestly, that happens to my kids. Like, my kids will come to me and they will ask me for something. Something that they want or something that they need. Or they'll ask me, can we go somewhere? Can we go do this? Uh, This one thing, I want to go here and I want to check this out. Or I want to go shopping or I want to go get ice cream or whatever that is. And my reply normally as a dad is, is I will say something along the lines of, hey, maybe that's something that we can do later. We're not going to do right now. Or maybe that we can do that tomorrow. Now, after years of my daughters hearing that response, my daughters know this, that that likely is most, that thing is not going to happen. Like, they've just learned that. Like, if I say that, it basically means no, right? Or they will bug me about it until I came in. Like, I told my daughters yesterday, I, I told them, I was out, I was like, I'm the biggest pushover ever. Like, they will ask me for something, I'm like, no, we're not going to do that. And then we get to the store, and I'm like, Oh my goodness, okay, just go get it. And like, I'm, I am the worst at, at, actually, I'm not the worst, but I, I love being able to spoil my kids as much as I can. But my youngest has actually learned this in me, and she has come up with a reply now. So when she asks something, or she wants to do something, I'm like, hey, we're well, not going to do that right now, or maybe we can do that later, or we can do that tomorrow. Her reply is this, yeah, right. <laughs> now, it's a little funny, but then I was like, I was like oh, that hurts. Because I have created that in my kid. They know my, they, they know my words. They know what that really means. And so her response has become, yeah, right. i tell you what, we need to make sure that our words correspond with our actions. And that our actions correspond with what we say. There are a few things more important in our lives than our character and our reputation. And simply by saying that we will do something and not doing it or what we say has a great effect on our character. And Jesus is particularly talking about taking oaths in this passage. So it's not just saying that you will do something or you won't do something. This goes a little bit further. It it dives into this idea of oaths and when we make promises. And oaths and promises are a little bit are, are, are similar, but there's a difference. An oath means that you are specifically bringing God into the equation. So have you ever made an oath like that? When you take an oath, you are calling on God as your witness, that you are going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, what? So help you, God, Right? Has anyone ever heard, heard someone say, I swear to God? Has anybody ever said that? Like, normally, normally we hear it in kids. Like, I remember this as, as being in elementary school where we would be out on the, on the playground and we would be out at recess and one of my friends would have like a snack, something that you really like, like a, like a Nutty Buddy, right? Or a fudge round or like Starburst or some sort of candy that you want. And so to get that item... I would say, I swear to God, I will bring you something tomorrow. Knowing full well that that does not exist at my house, nor that my mom or dad will take me to get that thing. (laughs) Right? So all of a sudden, now I'm a liar because I know that I'm not going to have that, even though I wanted something from them. And I would say, I swear to God, I will bring that to you. But when we do that, like, 
You know, like we're bringing God into to a promise. So let's look at what Jesus says about all of this, right? A promise should be a promise. When we say that, a promise should be a promise. Verse 33, Jesus says, Again, you have heard it said to the people long ago, nothing new, nothing new. Do not break your oath, but keep your oaths you have made to this Lord, to, uh, to the Lord. And this verse follows the same pattern in the previous verses in this section that you guys have already studied, right? Jesus, this is the same pattern in which he is teaching. In each case, Jesus brings, uh, begins by pointing out how the scribes and Pharisees have either restricted or misinterpreted the law, and they've twisted it. And then he goes on and he tells the real meaning behind that law. Because in the Old Testament, keeping oaths was a big deal. In Leviticus 19, uh, verse 12, it says, Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. So God says, look, don't make an oath and not follow through with it. Don't do that. Don't swear falsely by my name. Don't bring me into it if you're not going to do it. Numbers Chapter 30, verse 2, Moses said to the heads of the tribes of Israel, this is what the Lord commands. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything that he said. So oaths and making oaths are, are, are a big deal, when you, especially you're bringing God into it. Now there is nothing wrong with, with the, the idea of keeping oaths uh, in and of itself. Remember, Jesus upheld the authority of the Old Testament when he said, I have not come to abolish the law, but the, but the, prophets, uh, the, the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And the problem is this, that just as murder and adultery, the Pharisees were in, reinterpreting the law to find a way out of it. They were trying to create loopholes to which they could still keep the law, but still find a way around it and not really do it, to where it benefited them. Now, one of my favorite movie series, and I say series, like, do you, does anybody have a favorite movie? Like, we, we all have favorite movies, right? So I have a favorite movie series. I love the movie series, The Pirates of the Caribbean. All of them, right? You can't, you can't just say that you love or that you like Pirates of the Caribbean, the Black, you know, the Curse of the Black Pearl, Right? I like all of them. Now, now, you might have one that's more favorite than another, right? But I like them all. I think they're great. Now, we are introduced to a character very early on in the series. And this guy's name is Captain Barbosa, right? Yes, Captain Barbosa. He has taken over the Black Pearl, right? And because of what they have done, they have been cursed. But Captain, uh, Captain Hector Barbosa... He is really great at word manipulation and how he says things and what he says. He is intentionally deceptive at what he's saying. For an example, there's, a, there's this one point in the movie where he's addressing Miss Elizabeth Swan and, and they are trying to, to set her free. And then, as the way of which he is going to set her free is that he is going to make her walk the plank. Now... Our wonderful, handsome, strong, protective William Turner becomes... <laughs> all right, somebody who really likes uh, William Turner, all right. Uh, he comes along and he protests. And he says, Barbosa, you are a liar. You swore that she would go free. To which Barbosa responds in this way. I really tried to practice the, uh, the, the, the way that he said it. I'm going to do it. Let's laugh together as I do that, all right? Don't dare impuge me, honor boy. That's terrible. That is so awful. I will just read it. <laughs> he said, I would agree she would go free. But, to, uh, but it was uh, you who failed to specify when or where. And so he sets her free by making her walk the plank. And he does this another time too. It was like when he was just going to capture uh, Port Royal as well. Like He's like, you didn't really specify this. So he kind of twists and turns, and he became really good at that. See, well, the Pharisees, they were doing something very similar with the Old Testament commands on keeping, your, keeping our oaths. So the Pharisees, they, they went about and they created this system of keeping oaths. And they would make an oath, but not really. 
And the problem is, is that when they would do this, and when you and I do this, it kind of weakens the truth, doesn't it? It kind of weakens what we say, and it, and it speaks to our character. See, oaths are meant to strengthen the truth, but really, they weaken it. If you think about it, the only reason why oaths exist is because lies. If everyone everywhere were to tell the truth, there wouldn't really need to be oaths, would there be? See, God is always a witness to what we say. And in these next verses, Jesus absolutely destroys the Pharisees' little game of manipulation here. Look at what verses 34 through 36 says. It says, But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. So here it is. So Jesus exposes some of the real life ways in which the Pharisees tried to manipulate their oaths. So rather than, than going and saying that I swear by God's name, they would say something like, well, I swear by heaven that I'm going to tell you the truth. Or they would say stuff like, I swear by the gold in the temple that I'm telling you the truth. And they would say things like this, but not actually bring God into the situation. But Jesus says, they, we can't do any of this. This is, this is not the way that we treat one another. This is not speak well to your character. This is not how you are to make promises to people. And in this passage, Jesus says this. He says, that you think that you can swear by heaven and get away with it? It's not going to work. Why? Because heaven is, is where God reigns. Heaven is God's throne. And if you think that you're going to swear by earth, that is what God created. It is his footstool. It's where, it's where he, he comes and he dwells and the Holy Spirit is here and he lives within you, right? God is all in all of this. And if you think that you can swear by Jerusalem, Jerusalem, this is God's holy city. This is God's place. And you can't swear by yourself. Why can't you swear by yourself? Because God created you. So anytime that you try to make an oath that is outside of God, God is still in it. God is still a part of it. No matter what you swear by, God is involved. See, we have a similar saying that we use today, right? We say, cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, right? You can't swear by anything. You cannot swear by your own head. You cannot swear by any place or anything else because Jesus, or because God is there. So what Jesus is saying in these verses is this. You cannot escape God in your words. You cannot remove God from the equation. The Pharisees were trying to play this system in which they, were, um, they would try to make this oath, but not really. And so they wouldn't have to follow through, right? So they would say, hey, I swear by the temple that I'm going to do this. Well, then when the person would come back to, to, to claim that promise, they would say, well, I really didn't swear by God. You know, it was really by the temple or it was by this other thing. And so it was a loophole out and they didn't have to follow through with that thing. But Jesus said, God is always a witness to what you say, whether you call on him or or as a witness or not. And therefore, Jesus says, don't swear at all. Why? Because oaths actually weaken the truth. And secondly, God is always a witness to what you say. So do this. Let's just keep it simple. Let's just keep it simple. Verse 37, where Jesus simply says this, simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Your yes and your no is plenty. So what Jesus is saying, is, is saying here is this. First of all, let your yes, just use yes or no. And that should be all that you need. If you need to add something to your words to make them more credible, it brings into question your character. So think about it. If the other person asks you, do you promise? Maybe that shows you that they know something about you. Or they know something about your character already. So if somebody has to say to you, do you promise you're going to fulfill this? 
Do you promise that you're going to be a part of this? Are you, do you promise that you're going to show up? Do you promise that you're going to, to make this? Because when people are doing that, they're depending on that thing. So let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you're going to say that you're going to do something, do that thing. Be a person of your word. For after being in, in, in full-time ministry and, and working with a lot of wonderful people and people who have wonderful gifts and talents and um, volunteer and they serve the kingdom, like you guys have a lot of people he, that, here that serve, I have learned this, that I, will, I am more than happy and I am even um, ecstatic to hear a no. Because I know this, that if somebody's not able to do something, a no means that they just can't do it. And I can move on to the next person. If I ask somebody to do something and I say, and they say, well, maybe I need to do this. I need to check this and I need to do, and I might be able to be here. I have something going on. At that point, I'm already like, hey, it's okay. I can ask somebody else. Because what I don't want to do is um, expect them to be there and allow that, that hemming and hawing to be their yes. And then we're left short. A no is always okay. <laughs> All right? A no is okay. You can tell Chris no. That's totally fine. <laughs> if you're not able to do it, right? I can always take a no. So let's not say we're going to do something and, uh, and then not show up to do it, right? Because when we, when we do that, like, it almost becomes a lies. And, and lies are not what should come from followers of Jesus. And we know this, that lies are from Satan. John chapter 8, verse 44, it says, He is a murderer from the very beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And Jesus says the best way to avoid swearing at all is to keep it simple, to say yes or no, and then stick with it. Now, I'll tell you what, if I had a volunteer that told me no and then they showed up to help that morning, fantastic, good, they showed up. I got an extra person and it's fantastic. So you can tell Chris no and then show up and help out. It's perfectly fine too. So maybe this morning some, 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 some good O's that we can think about that we take are, are these, right? Is it ever wrong to take an oath? No. So what are some good O's that we take? Marriage vows. It's a great oath. That's a promise, right? Marriage is something that God created. We enter into with our spouse, but it's also a relationship that we enter into with God. And when we make that oath and that promise, God is brought into that. Or maybe we have, we have a, a, a person who's going into full-time ministry and we set them apart and they take that vow and that oath to be a servant in the kingdom Signing a contract, a sworn testimony in court. So it's okay to take oaths, but we have to follow through with them. Deuteronomy 10, 20 says, Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. And even God himself took oaths and made promises. Hebrews six seventeen says, Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his of His." purpose very clear to the heirs of what he had promised he confirmed it with an oath and not only do we have that example but we also have the example that jesus took an oath while he was in uh while he was in court matthew chapter 26 verses 63 and 64 the high priest said to him i charge you under oath by the living god tell us that you are the christ the son of the living god and he says this yes it is as you say and then we have the example of Paul and that he writes in his letters several times. Romans chapter 1 verse 9 says, God is my witness and how constantly I remember you in my prayers. And we see that in his letters over and over again, that he makes the promise, I am praying for you. I am for you. I want your church to do well. I want you to be followers of Jesus. I want you to make an effect in this world. And he makes that promise. So what do we do with all of this teaching this morning about Jesus? About being truthful and following through with our promise. So let's break it down real easy. I'll give you three things this morning, all right, that we can all digest. Here we go. First thing, be truthful. It's real simple. Be truthful. Proverbs 12, 22 says, The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in men who are truthful. That means that we shouldn't lie. We shouldn't exaggerate. 
We shouldn't distort. Speaking the truth is absolutely necessary for trust because here's what it does. It speaks to our character, right? It speaks to who we are. People know that that's, that, that telling the truth or, or lie telling, that, that that speaks to, to our person. It's necessary for us. It is important for us to follow through with what we're going to say because it's our, it's our integrity. It is our character. And we need to follow through with what we say that we're going to do. Be truthful. Secondly, be careful. Be careful in what you say and how you say things. Ecclesiastes 5 says this, Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. It is better to vow, to not vow, than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Because remember, we said earlier on, no matter what we make a promise on, no matter what we make an oath on or a vow, God is always involved. Whether you swear by your mom, or you swear by a place, or a thing, whatever that is, you need to remember that God is involved in that. Be careful what we say. Be careful the promises that you make to people. Can you fulfill that obligation? Can you follow through? Do you have the necessary things to do that? Do you have the talent to do that? Don't ask me to build anything. At one time I wanted to work with wood. I found out that I am not a woodworker, okay? I know. I know how, look, I've learned this. I know how to hang up curtain rods. I know how to, <laughs> I know, I know how to put up blinds. Uh, and I know how to hang up a TV in a room that is only a quarter inch higher on the left than the right, okay? Don't come to my house. <laughs> oh, you can. You can come to my house. Just don't say anything about my TV, all right? Be careful what you say. Can you do that thing? Can you fulfill it? Can you follow through? Thirdly, this morning, be faithful in that. Psalm 15 says, He who walks is blameless, who speaks the truth from his heart, who keeps an oath even when it hurts. He who does these things will never be shaken. Speak the truth from your heart. And once you've given your word, follow through with that thing. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. The other side of that, though, is that we're human. We make mistakes. I don't always fulfill the promise that I make. I fall short. We make, um, we make mistakes. We forget. I am probably one of the most forgetful people you will ever meet in your life. I have let people down. I have missed lunches. <laughs> I have missed meetings. If I don't write something down or put it in my phone with an alarm, I'm probably not going to be there. It's just a part of who I am. So I know that I have to write things down. And I don't do it intentionally. The last thing that I would ever, personally, what I I would ever want to do, and I'm sure the same for you, is to hurt somebody else. And sometimes in what we say that we're going to do, or what we're not going to do, or that when we say we're going to do something and we don't show up, it hurts. And it also hurt. not only does it hurt the person, but it speaks to our character and who we are. So this morning, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's keep it simple. Let's let our yes be yes and our no be no. There's no, re, no, no reason to say, I, I swear to God I'm going to show up. You shouldn't have to. Let's keep it simple. Let's be truthful. Let's follow through what we're going to say, that, that, that we say that we're going to do. Be careful in how we say that and be faithful in our promises.